Well, thank you for joining us on this Labor Day weekend. You guys are extra holy. Hope you're excited to hear from God through His Word. Are you excited? Yes. Hope you are. Um, so if you would take your Bibles out. Hope you bought your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. It's near the end of your Bible. If this is the first time with us. A special welcome to you and your family this morning. Just to catch you up on where we've been, today we are finishing up a series entitled Rethinking the Church. Hope this has been edifying, encouraging, and uh, good for your walk with Jesus. In this series, we've explored the idea of what the church would look like if we modeled it on how God designed it to be in Scripture. Because there are so many different views and perceptions of the church in this day and age. What the church is and its function in our lives. So many different perceptions. Some see it as wholesome weekend entertainment. Some see it as motivational. Some see the church as a pick-me-up. Or some just see the church as good family-oriented service to include in one's monthly or seasonal routine. And even though those pursuits aren't evil in and of themselves... They don't fully capture who the Bible has called us to be as the church of the living God. And so our goal for these weeks has been to explore how God has built his church in his word. And then for us, after looking at these spiritual values, for us to say yes to his plan for us. For us to say yes to his design for his local church. Thus far, we've discussed a couple of things. We've discussed that God's people are hallmarked by generosity. That we are a generous people who stand in awe of God's lavish generosity towards us and long to put that on display through everything that we have to everyone around us. Then we saw in Acts chapter 11 that God's church has and will always be driven by a desire to multiply, to reach those around us despite inevitable opposition, to pursue the lost and the weary with devoted and persistent hearts. Then we saw in scripture that God's church is also called to live in intimate community with one another. A fellowship that is founded on our common faith in Christ, that is expressed in our mutual participation in kingdom work and displayed by a passion to be faithful to one another and forgive one another when one is offended. And then last, we've considered that God's church values gospel centrality, or more specifically, that we value the preeminence, the power, and the practice of the word of God among us, whether at our services, in our kids' ministries, outreach, and in our relationships, we are passionate about the glory of God found in his word and in the message of the gospel. Amen? Which leads us today to the final piece of the puzzle in relation to this series, and it is that God's church values diversity. That God's church values diversity. For clarity here, that God's church, God's people cherish ethnic and racial diversity. This topic in particular strikes a chord in my heart for a number of reasons. Firstly, because of the heightened coverage that racial tensions have received in our nation over the last couple of years. Whether through incidents involving police brutality, shootings of churches, political rhetoric, and protests by athletes alike. And so do I feel that the church has work to do in this area? Absolutely. But do I feel that the church has the spiritual resources necessary to lead the way in reconciliation? You better believe it. I believe that the church is called to be the light of the world, and that includes issues related to racial harmony. That the gospel is and will always be the healing for hate and division in humanity. Amen? Secondly, this topic strikes a chord with me because of the upbringing that I received while growing up in the nation of South Africa, a nation that transitioned in my lifetime from a political era of apartheid to their first general elections in 1994, and elections that for the first time allowed all adult citizens, regardless of property ownership, income, race, ethnicity, all adult citizens to cast their vote and let their voice be heard. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term apartheid, it was an institutionalized system of racial segregation that existed in its purest form from approximately 1948 to the early to mid-90s. Its purpose was simple, 
to repress black, colored, and even Asian South Africans in order to ensure the economic, political, and social supremacy of the minority white population. Some of the stipulations of the system, just to name a few, included the following. Outlawing marriage or any form of intimate relationship across racial lines. Forced places of residence determined by race. That means that you would never have a neighbor that didn't look like you. Municipal grounds reserved for particular races, like separate beaches, buses, hospitals, schools, and universities, and even a separate system of education for black students, designed solely to prepare them for lives confined to the laboring class. So they would never be able to pursue better opportunities for their family or for their children because they were born black. So for my sister and I, and Matt included, we saw this played out in a number of ways, even reflecting with my sister this last week. I can remember never having a fellow student of the black race in our formative years of schooling. I don't know if you can find me there. Only white teachers, only white administrators, and the majority, I would say 99% white. Maybe there were some exchange students, maybe one. We attended churches that only consisted, and let me refine that, only welcomed those of the Caucasian leaning. We never had friends that weren't white. We never went to restaurants that had customers that weren't all white. Our worldview was consumed with rhetoric of white superiority and white power. Come to think of it, the only interactions with people of the black race that we had was seeing them work as maids in households. Gardeners and construction workers, janitors and petrol attendants at gas stations. Yes, we have those things in South Africa. And truthfully, growing up in an environment like this will inevitably ingrain in one's mind the idea that black people are less than white people. That they have less value, less worth, that they are dangerous and outlaw and unlawful, untrustworthy, that they are uneducated, not as gifted as us as white people. A, a horrific and sinful era that thankfully, praise be to God for this, came to an end in the early to mid-90s. After which I can remember the first time that black kids joined our school. I remember learning to pronounce names that were foreign to us. I remember being taught to draw a new national flag and include Isisulu in our annual, annual curriculum. I remember the first time we made friends with Philemon and Mohamotsi and Esther at church and had them over to play at our house. And not only had them over, but to stay the night. And what a stir that caused in my grandparents' heart and mine, who would never have considered that a possibility, let alone a pleasure. In retrospect, I am thankful to have had the opportunity to be enriched by the uniqueness and the beauty of other cultures. And thankfully, I'm thankful spiritually to have found that the God that we serve shows no partiality. Plays no favorites. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 9. I'm thankful to have found that we serve a God who designs all ethnic groups in his image and for his glory. Genesis 1.27. I'm thankful to have found that we serve a God whose message of salvation isn't confined to a certain race or ethnicity. And also to have found that we, we have a gospel that has the power to save and even unite those from every ethnicity around the world. Ephesians chapter 2.16. This is why this topic means so much to me. Because unity in diversity serves to magnify the power, the love, and the matchless grace of our God. 
And so a couple of weeks ago, we read about the early church in Acts 11, and we saw the moment when this radical racial shift stirred in the community of faith. And instead of rehashing that account today, I want us to dive into Ephesians chapter 2 for two reasons. Firstly, to search through some of the truths and promises that God has left his church in regard to the topic of diversity. And then secondly, to consider very briefly some of the practical applications of these truths. And man, I've been praying very fervently this last week that God would do a radical work inside every single one of us and for every one of us to search our heart and for the Holy Spirit to expose any hidden prejudices that still may exist in there. Pray for that today and then I've been praying that God would do a radical work in us corporately so that in the years and generations to come that Providence City Church would always be a light of reconciliation in a world enslaved to separation and segregation. Are you with me with that? So would you turn in your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11 today. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. This is Paul speaking to the Gentile church in the city of Ephesus. The Gentiles being those like you and I outside the commonwealth of Israel. And so this is Paul writing to the Gentiles. You guys with me? Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Paul pointing out how silly that is. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now something incredible has happened. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both. Jews and Gentiles are like two God in one body. How? Through the cross, therefore, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Verse 19 says this. What a beautiful picture this is. And so now you are no longer strangers, no longer aliens. I mean, get rid of those man-made divisions and hate. But you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are part of the same kingdom and members of the household of God. You're now family built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also have been built together into a dwelling place. A dwelling place for God by his spirit. Let's pray together as we go to God's word this morning. God, this is a weighty topic. It continually populates the news streams, our social media feeds. It's a topic that continues to divide what your blood has bought, which is peace and unity. So, Father, now as we proclaim your word, would you please, by your grace, God, do something powerful today. Expose in us that which is not of you, Jesus. God, we want to be like you, God. We want your spirit. We want this church to be the dwelling place for the spirit, God. And we know that that exists in a community that is committed to diversity, God. A community that's committed to celebrating that. So glorify your name by saving those among us who haven't surrendered to you. By changing, changing us, God, into a pure reflection of your image. By revealing to us the beauty of who you are and the beauty of your church. And using a weak vessel like me, God, to do incredible things in our church today. In your name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. 
All right, so simply in this text today, four observations that I want to get you, give you today. And I really want to get to the end because the application of this text is, is, I mean, so big and so important for us in our culture, but also in our church. And so four observations from this text. If you'd like to write the first one, it is this this morning. I want you to notice in this text, and I'm going to take you to the end. I want to take you to the beauty of this text. I want you to notice the great destiny of the church, the great destiny of the church. Church lingo would render it, notice the divine reconciliation within the body of Christ or the supernatural harmony that Christ has won for his people. I mean, see, at the beginning of this text in verses 11 to 12, we see this, don't miss it, this distinct separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul describes the Gentiles here as the uncircumcision, basically racial name-calling the Gentiles. A derogatory term given to them by the puffed up Jews. You see, humanity has been doing this kind of thing since the beginning of the church. This is not a new device in our culture. Paul is saying that you are less than, that you are less valued, less worthy than God's chosen nation as perceived by the Jews. That you are outsiders, estranged, alienated from God's people, strangers to the powerful promises of Almighty God. Notice at the beginning of this text, there was a drastic and distinct divide between these two people groups. But that drastic divide miraculously gives way to a divine unity that exists across racial lines in verses 19 to 22, where the strangers are now fellow citizens in the kingdom, that they belong there, that they have a spiritual passport, that you belong to this place, and the aliens are now members of the household of God. That you are brothers and sisters in the family of faith. There's this divine unity in the church built on Jesus. A unity of a diverse group of people who grow together into what is called the temple of the living God. And the temple is defined in verse 22 as the dwelling place of God by His Spirit. And so please don't miss the picture. This is a very short point. Please don't miss the picture here. That God's people... That God's church is an ethnically diverse group of people. Bonded by the supernatural power of Jesus. That's who we are as the church. Your opinion doesn't matter in that. That's what, we are a diverse group of people whose racial unity then fuels the power, the experience, and the display of God's spirit among us. Or perhaps I'd be bold enough to put it like this today. The spirit of the living God is pleased to dwell among diversity. The spirit of the living God is pleased to dwell and move in the presence of diversity. Please notice at the beginning of the great destiny of the church. You can even flip to the end of your Bible, go to the book of Revelation, and you'll see the fulfillment of these truths. We're at the end of time. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation will bow before the throne of God and sing together in in one voice, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's the divine destiny of the church. Point number two for us today is this. I want you to notice the great divide that existed in the church. Because that supernatural unity, that great destiny that we just spoke of there, will never astound you until you grasp even a portion of, man, the hatred and the hostility that existed between the Jews and the Gentile. Please get this today. That this was not a casual dislike between acquaintances. I don't really like, I don't want to spend, you irritate me. That's not what this was. This was a deep seated resentment that, that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. The tragic part about the separation is that God never intended the Jews to twist his calling on their people into a sense of entitlement and pride and arrogance. You see, the Jews were supposed to be the light to the nations, but they abused that privilege and twisted it to mean that God favors us more than anyone else, that there must be something special about us. 
And it was this national pride that ended up turning the relationships between Jews and Gentiles, not merely into disdain for one another, but into outright hostility towards them. And I mean, please, I need to grind this home today that these rivers of hostility and hate ran deep, deep into the constructs of religion, culture, and race. And I just want to give you a little picture of how this played out in their day and age. You see, the Jews, please listen to this, the Jews maintained that God created the Gentiles to fuel the fires of hell. That was the purpose of their existence. Just imagine that. Imagine growing up with that mentality. Imagine teaching your children that about other people. That's why the disciples were amazed at Jesus when he decided to take a detour through the region of Samaria, right? And then not only take a detour through there, but sit with a Samaritan, let alone a Samaritan woman, and discuss with her the rivers of living water. You see, because the disciples in their Jewishness thought the Samaritans were dogs, were pigs, were purely created to fuel the fires of hell. They even made it, the Jews even made it unlawful to help a laboring Gentile mother because it would aid the arrival of another abomination into humanity. And heaven forbid a Jew ever marry a Gentile. Because if they did, it would be seen as the equivalent to a death. Mourning and sorrow would ensue in the family and the community alike. But hear me today. There is nowhere that this division is more radically depicted, listen to this, than in the place of worship. In the temple. Where the powers that be constructed what was called the dividing wall of hostility. A visible representation of this huge and deep divide. You see, the temple was built, and I put up a diagram for you guys. The temple, you can see where the temple building is in yellow. The temple was built on an elevated platform. And around the temple existed the court of the priests, the court of Israel, and then the court of women. And then after the court of women, five steps would lead down to a walled platform. And after that walled platform, another 14 steps down to a five foot wide walled barricade, which began what was called the court of the Gentiles. In other words, if a Gentile family wanted to come and pray, wanted to come and worship and intercede before the living God, they would merely be allowed to see the temple from a distance. And under no circumstances would they be allowed to approach the inner courts and heaven forbid, ever approach the actual temple itself. In fact, warnings, you know, archaeologists have found these. Warnings were displayed on these walls which read the following. No foreigner, no Gentile may enter within this barrier. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Approaching beyond this dividing wall of hostility would result in execution of any Gentile. I want you to see here that this is not a mere casual dislike between acquaintances. This is a deep seated resentment and, that, and hate that stirred among racial lines. And so the question remains for us today. Here's the poignant question. Who can conquer such a great divide? Who can destroy the dividing walls between us? Walls built up by personal preferences and pride. Who can heal such hatred and hostility and bind us together, not as friends, but bind us together as family who love one another, who bear one another's burdens and who care for one Who can do that? Which leads us to third observation today. The great deliverer of the church. Who can conquer the divide of racism? I know his name. He's a friend of mine. He's my Lord and my Savior. His name is King Jesus. The Word of God reminds us today 
that the power of Jesus' blood on the cross of Calvary, in verses 13 to 18, is sufficient to conquer the divide of race and hatred. Is that good news today? The cross is sufficient to supernaturally bring about peace where disdain once remained. Or the way I like to see it is this, and I hope this strikes a chord in your heart as well, that the cross of Calvary was the funeral service of racism. Let me say it again. The cross of Calvary was the funeral service of racism. Because in Jesus' victory, he ushered in a new kingdom where those who were once separated by man-made devices and desires can now live together as one, can live together now at peace with one another. Verse 13 said the following, For those who were once far off, far and deeply divided, have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. And it is through His sacrifice that we have peace, not only with God, but with one another. For Christ has made us both a one and has broken down in His flesh. I love the, 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 if you see the temple now, look at what this is saying. That, the, that He has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. In fact, it says in verse 16 that the cross of Christ has killed the hostility that severed our unity. Isn't that wonderful news today? What a savior we serve. What a king that we worship. And let me make this even more clear and explicit for us today. Do you know what that means? That means that Jesus took on his body every ounce of wrath for every moment of racism in history. From Jewish hostility in biblical times to the establishment of slavery, anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany, to the institutionalized apartheid of South Africa, and even to the name-calling, profiling, brutality, and unfair wage structures of every person to ever live. Jesus paid the price for them all and declared with his last breath that it is finished. Isn't that glorious today? And you know, on the third day when he walked out of that tomb, victorious over death and sin, a new kingdom and a new temple emerged, a temple made of people transformed by the blood and the love of Jesus, a people freed from the shackles of sin and hate and divide, and a people defined now by the grace and the love of Jesus. Friends, this is the great deliverer of the church. Let me be more specific. This is the conqueror of racism, and his name is King Jesus. How can we as the church exist in a mentality of separation when we serve the king who has conquered it once and for all? That's the church of the... We are the church. We are his people. And we are his witnesses. So as we close today, I want us to consider the implications of this truth. What it means for us individually and what it means for us corporately. Or in other words, how this pursuit of racial reconciliation affects our identities in our community and as Christians and practically in our faith. And there are seminars on this, folks. There are seminars. This is a weighty topic on how this plays out in our lives. And so I just want to make some broad brushstrokes today. Hopefully this will spark some reflection and discussion within you during the week and in the months and the years ahead. So the last point that I want to bring to you today is the great desire for the church the great desire for the church. And just being vulnerable with you for a second, one of the aspects of this message that required some extra effort is asking God to provide some insight into how these truths impact the experience and the reality of a Christian from a minority race. Because it's evident in my life that for the overwhelming majority of my adult years, I've lived as a member of the dominant demographic of the culture. And so in many regards, I'm naive and somewhat unaware of the dynamics associated with race relations, which led me to meet up with a pastor friend of mine who is an African-American and pick his brain on how I can, as a brother of Christ, love him more effectively. And how can we as a church foster a culture of racial reconciliation and diversity. 
And you know, due to how, man, it was awesome. It was an awesome, awesome time. Due to how enlightening the discussion was with my fellow African-American brother, I, I just wanted to play you two clips from an African-American pastor, not, not my friend, but a guy called Brian Lawrence. And he's going to, in this first video, give us some insight into how the gospel changes our outlook on racial reconciliation. Please pay attention to this video. So yeah, when, when Jesus invades your life, so if you're, if you're looking at this and you're going, I'm a new Christian, or what does it mean to be a Christian? No matter what your culture or ethnicity may be, when Jesus invades your life, he now becomes preeminent and supreme, which means he's now the son that I've got to orbit my life around and not the other way around. In other words, I'm not the S-U-N that he orbits around. And I go, let me just have enough Jesus to make myself happy. No, it's an incredible paradigm shifter. That's what Paul gets to in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he says, if anyone's in Christ, you're a new creation. Old is gone, new has come. Now that's got comprehensive implications. And one of those implications is how I view matters of race, right? He saves me, he doesn't eradicate my blackness but now he becomes the supreme place of priority in my life, which means I must subjugate my blackness to his Jesusness. It's a game changer. So now when I sit at the table with people who see things differently, who look differently, and even when I encounter people in the name of Jesus Christ who do racially insensitive things, now I must go, that's my brother in Christ. That's my sister in Christ. What has God called me to do? John chapter 13. By this will all people know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. Love doesn't ignore, it calls out, just like Paul did with Peter in Galatians chapter two. Hey man, prior to the Gentiles coming, to the Jews coming, used to sit with Gentiles. And now that the Jews are here, you don't sit with them. In love, I'm coming to you. That's out of step with the gospel. So love doesn't pat you on the back and say, do you? Love has hard conversations. But love says at the end of the day, regardless of your ethnicity, if we are in Christ especially, we are bonded together. We are, we are one with one another. And because of that, the gospel pushes me to forgive, to forgive those who've wronged me. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. In fact, Jesus says in that passage, if you don't forgive, the implication is you're not really a follower of me. So a Christian who holds a grudge, oxymoron. So what I would say to my minority friends is, I understand the hurt, and it's real. And I can sympathize and empathize because I've had the same hurt. But let me ask you, I think the gospel calls you to a higher standard. So let's walk through this. So that's forgiveness. But here's the deal. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. You can forgive without being reconciled, but you cannot reconcile without forgiving. Forgiving takes one person, reconciliation takes two. So if I'm going to really walk in unity with white people and, 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 and experience true unity with them, there's got to be a mutual commitment on both sides of the table to walk in humility with one another and to lay our cultural preferences and norms at the feet of each other because the tie that binds us is greater than anything that div divides us. It's Jesus Christ. That's why Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, as best as you can, be at peace with all people. I love that because sometimes you do your best and there's no peace there. But the love of Christ keeps me coming back to the table and say, hey, let's work this thing out and let's work it out and let's work it out. Now, did you hear those two things I just wanted you to take away from that video? Is that you can forgive without reconciling, but you can't reconcile without forgiving. It takes two to reconcile. Powerful, powerful truth. But also I want you to hear this one that was reiterated to me when I met up with my pastor friend. He said, Jesus doesn't eradicate our uniqueness. Jesus doesn't eradicate my whiteness or your blackness. Because in essence, hear me, unity is not uniformity. One of the comments my friend made this last week was the following. One of the ways he feels the presence of God in his church is they don't desire to be color blind. They desire to be color blessed. Because we are all made in the image of God, Genesis 1:27. Every one of us intentionally and uniquely designed for the display of his glory. Amen. Help us, Lord Jesus, 
Help us, Lord Jesus, to celebrate your unique design and also be humble enough to consider and listen to one another as we seek to live together as one. Now, that's the identity piece, right? And listen, I know that I'm making broad strokes here, but I want this to spark some discussion and reflection in your, whole, in your own life. And so I want to finish today with one more video as he talks about some of the ways this plays out corporately and in your community. Please listen, there are some powerful, powerful truths in this video. You can cue this. When we talk about matters of race, I think it's very important to begin with the thought that because we all bear some sort of an ethnicity or multiple ethnicities, like my kids do, I mean, they're a little bit of Mexican, a little bit of Irish, a little bit of African American, that, that shapes our view of the world. Here's what I'm saying. If you're listening to this and you're white, most white people do not consciously see themselves as being white. I really don't believe that. Sort of like, I don't consciously see myself as having two arms. It's just how I function. I want you to view minorities, though, as having one arm. If you're a one-armed person in a two-armed society, you are consistently aware of the fact that you've got one arm. So if I'm going to build bridges and have authentic relationships as a two-armed person with a one-armed person, there's got to be this driving sense of sensitivity and awareness and compassion towards them. Not as some pet projects, but I need to take some steps towards them. So I would say, first of all, you got to flip a switch and go, I've been created with a certain ethnicity. My ethnicity, no matter who you are, African American, Mexican, uh, Chinese, white, no matter who you are, your ethnicity has some great things about it, but it also comes with some limitations. And what you need is, you need a multi-ethnic tribe of friendships who are going to press against your personal preferences and cultural norms, and in that emerges a beauty. That's why I think God's primary tool in sanctifying us outside of the Holy Spirit are other people. And you need other people in your life who don't see it the way you see it, right? So. If you're a white person, let's say, um, and you, you, you have been raised with an ethic of the police are your friends. So if your cat gets stuck in the trees, we call the police, police comes over, gets the cat out. That's kind of your ethic. That's the world you grew up in. They were your friends. Well, if you're an African American maybe, and you grew up in a different context, and police were not someone to be friendly with, but if police were around, it's because something drastically was wrong and you could end up being killed or going to go, go to jail. That's a completely different perspective. Now let me ask you a question. Whose perspective is right and who's wrong? I don't think it's a matter of right or wrong. I just think it's a matter of seeing things differently. So what we have to do is check a box and go, I have a perspective, box number two. My perspective is not always right. And it takes humility to see that. And so I may be a part of the Fox News crowd. I may, be, I may be a part of the MSNBC crowd or the CNN crowd. But what I need is, if I'm part of the CNN crowd, I need my Fox News friends to show me a different way of looking at it. Instead of seeing things through a black and white, right and wrong perspective, now we've got some beauty here. Now there's the yin and yang. Corey Edwards, a PhD at The Ohio State University, she says this, she says, if you actually go to, to a homogenous church, homogenous churches actually entrench racism. Why? Are homogenous churches racist? That's not her point. She's saying, in a homogenous church where everybody pretty much sees it generally from the same perspective, then those perspectives get deepened and entrenched. The beauty of a multi-ethnic church is you, you, you have people who see it differently, who there's some give and take there. I just, not too long ago, White lady at my church, I pastor a multi-ethnic church on the West Coast. White lady at my church is the head of the Donald Trump campaign for Santa Clara. She asked me and our mostly African-American elder board to anoint her with oil and pray over her. Now we didn't do that in service and we didn't pray over Donald Trump, we prayed over her. But do you not think there was some angst among some of my African-American elders? Of course there is, but I think there's beauty in that. I love the fact that you can't label our church the Republican church or the Democratic church. So, so we, we've got to have the humility to go, 
there's different perspectives here. And so now I come into the relationship not trying to clone somebody in my image, but I come into the relationship going, you bring something to the table, I don't. There's a way of seeing God and seeing life that you have that I don't have. Let me learn from you. I think that's the beauty of it. And as long as you come with humility, I think the rest is a lot easier. Powerful, right? Really powerful. I'm go if I'm going to build bridges and have authentic relationships with minorities, there has to be a driving sense of sensitivity, awareness, and compassion. I love how we emphasize humility too. Humility. There's got to be humility there. Because so often we just want to close our eyes. Look, we're in... Or so often we have a driving force to create a facade of unity without genuine, genuinely pursuing unity. And so the way that we often do that, is we just block our eyes off and say, well, let's just pretend that we're the same. Rather than acknowledging who you are uniquely through your experiences and who I am uniquely through my experiences. I love what he also said here. We each need a multi-ethnic tribe of friendships that are going to press against our cultural norms. And that gift will bring about the beauty of the kingdom among us. Isn't that interesting? We are truly better together. And so as we close today, because we're going to go get some ice cream over there. Here's been my prayer in response to this text in Ephesians 2, and I pray it is yours. Threefold. First one is this, that Lord, would you expose any hidden prejudices that I may have in my heart? I repent of those immediately and say that this is not of you. And additionally, God, I ask for forgiveness for the ways that I've thought and the ways that I've acted towards those who look differently to me. Cleanse me today, God, and make me more like you. That's first. Number two is this. God, help me to be more intentional about developing relationships with those outside of my race. For there is beauty and benefit in living in a diverse community. Your word tells me that, Lord. And you know this is going to take sacrifice on my part, but Lord, help me to know that the result is worth the effort. That was point number two. And point number three as we close. Finally, God, would you, by your grace and the power of your spirit, foster at Providence City Church a culture that is welcoming to all ethnicities, a church family that celebrates all walks of life and loves all members of society. I pray that you, God, would provide for us many influential leaders, God, from the Hispanic, Black, Asian, Middle Eastern, white, demographic, all of those, God, so that in the future, our leadership and our staff can reflect the diversity of your city, and your world. Lord, let PCC be an even greater reflection of your kingdom and your grace. Those are my three prayers.